Hello, everyone. My name is Olivia with Redmond, and I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today. The topic of today's webcast is Understanding and Protecting Kerberos, the soft underbelly of cybersecurity sponsored by Simperis. Simperis is the pioneer of identity-driven cyber resilience for cross-cloud and hybrid environments. The company provides cyber preparedness, incident response, and disaster recovery solutions for enterprise directory services the keys to the kingdom. Symperius's patent, patent excuse me, technology for Microsoft Active Directory protects over 40 million identities from cyber attacks, data breaches, and operational errors. But before we begin, I'd like to go ahead and cover a few important housekeeping details. First and foremost, we will be having a Q&A session towards the end of today's presentation. So please take a moment to type in your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation and as they, as they come to mind. Next, Simperis has provided some phenomenal resources on the right-hand side of your screen. So please take a moment to check those out. You would not want to miss them. And finally, today's webcast is being recorded. So keep an eye out tomorrow for a link that you can share with a colleague or to rewatch the presentation. And now finally, I'd like to introduce you to our wonderful speakers that we have today. We have the pleasure of hearing from Alad Shamir, the Director of Breach Preparedness and Response at Simperis, as well as Sean Duby, Director of Services at Simperis. So I know we are all in for a great event. And with that, Alad, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Olivia. So as Olivia just mentioned, my name is Alad Shamir, and I'm the Director of Breach Preparedness and Response at Simperis. My background is more of the offensive side of the security industry. I spent most of my career hacking into organizations and compromising their active directories and their crown jewels legally, of course, as part of penetration testing engagements and red team exercises. My favorite attack chains always involved Kerberos and Kerberos delegation, which is the topic of this session. With me, we have my colleague, Sean. Sean, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sean Duby, Director of Services for Sempras. I like to think of myself as well, first off, I love the opportunity to think of Elad as being offensive. Uh, so that's a, that's all I, I never hesitate to take advantage of that. And I've spent most of my career in and around Active Directory since it was invented on the IT pro side of thing. How do you design Active Directory? How do you build it and run it securely? So uh, I think that this is a this is a good pairing. Elad will spend a lot of time talking about vulnerabilities and I'll do my best to sort of put it from an IT pro point of view um, from there. So yeah, take it away, Lad. Awesome. So of course we can't talk about Kerberos without first covering Kerberos 101. Usually when you hear uh, classes or sessions about Kerberos, you hear a bit about um, the Greek mythology of uh, the three-headed dog and you see a diagram like this one on the right that I got from, from Wikipedia. But that's not only boring, it's confusing as well. And I would like to do something else today instead. I'd like to tell you the real story behind the Kerberos protocol, the story that was the inspiration for this protocol. So it all started in the 70s, in 1974 to be precise, uh, with Bill. Bill is a successful entrepreneur, and he decided to open an amusement park. And he didn't really like how in most amusement parks, kids are lying about their age and stand on their tippy toes to seem like they're taller and get on rides that they shouldn't get onto. So Bill decided to come up with a new and improved model. It all starts with the Luna Club. Every visitor must become a member. And once you become a member, they keep uh, some data on file, uh, such as the member's name, date of birth, their height, and their group memberships, which represent what rides they're allowed to get on, such as the roller coaster, the bumper cars, etc. And everyone also gets a secret code for authentication. Now, let's say someone wants to get on a ride. So this is Alice. She's going to be our hero today and she wants to get on the roller coaster. First, she needs to go to the ticket office. 
authenticate using our secret code and pay for entry. At the ticket office, they will pull her data from the Luna Club database and issue a day pass for her. The day pass has an expiry date and some information about her, like her name, date of birth, height, group memberships, etc. This day pass is encrypted using a secret key that only the ticket office knows. Now let's say Alice wants to get on a ride on the roller coaster. First, she needs to go to the ticket office, present her day pass. The ticket office will then decrypt the day pass and validate it. So it decrypted successfully and it's not expired, so it's valid. Then the ticket office copies all the information from the day pass to a new ticket, a ride ticket, for Alice to the roller coaster and encrypt this ticket with a different key that only the ticket office and the ride operator know. Now, when Alice wants to get on the ride, she can go to the roller coaster, present her ride ticket to the ride operator. The ride operator then decrypts the ticket and validates it. So we decrypt it successfully, it's not expired. Alice is old enough to get on the roller coaster and she's old enough to get on the roller coaster and she's a member of the roller coaster group. So Alice is allowed to get on the ride. And this is essentially how Kerberos works. The analogy is pretty straightforward. Uh, in Kerberos, you have some authentication mechanism where the user needs to encrypt a timestamp with their password. And in the amusement park, we have the secret code. In Kerberos, we have the KDC, or in Active Directory environments, we have the domain controller. In the amusement park, we have the ticket office. The day pass is what we call the ticket granting ticket, or TGT for short, in Kerberos. The right ticket is a service ticket. The operator would be a service account in Kerberos. The ticket office key is the equivalent of the Kerberos TGT account key in Kerberos in Active Directory. And the operator's password or key, for example, the, the roller coaster operator's key is the equivalent of a service account password. The right name would be a service print, a principal name in Kerberos and Active Directory. Deal would be a domain admin. The visitors would be users. And in Active Directory, we also have something called a privileged, privileged attribute certificate, or PAC for short. That includes a lot of information uh, about the user and if it is signed and so on. We have a mini version of that in our story here with you know all, all the um, visitors' details on the ticket, such as their age, group memberships, etc. Now, I really don't like these kind of diagrams. As I said, they're boring and confusing, but we'll go through it quickly <laughs> just so that we can uh, you know pay lip service to the protocol. So when a user wants to authenticate using Kerberos, First, they need to send an AS trick um, and message to the domain controller to say, hey, I am who I am, please give me a TGT. If the user successfully encrypts a timestamp with their password, the domain controller would indeed give the user a TGT, which is the equivalent of the day pass. Now, let's say the user wants to authenticate to service A. The user can't just show the TGT to service A. Service A wouldn't know what to do with it. Instead, the user needs to go to the domain controller, request a service ticket to service A. The domain controller will validate the TGT, copy the information from the TGT to a new service, service ticket um, for the user to service A, and encrypt that ticket with service A's password. Now, the user can present that to service A and successfully authenticate. Now, let's say the user wants to authenticate to another service, service B. The user cannot use the same service ticket because service A and service B should have different passwords and service B should fail to decrypt that service ticket. Instead, the user first goes to the domain controller again, requests a service ticket, specific, service ticket specifically to service B, get that, and only then can authenticate to service B. Now we can get back to our story, which I believe is more interesting than those, those diagrams. 
we can see here side by side uh, the day pass uh, encrypted and in clear text as well plain text as well as the writing uh, encrypted and in plain text can anyone take a moment to figure out what what's the cipher what's the what's the key here I know that Sean is very sharp, probably figured it out. Yeah, uh, what you've done is you've um, you've shifted uh, you shifted the letters by by one, right? Uh, let me see what we got. No, it's shifted by where's my GP? Yeah, it's sh they're shifted by one, right? So mm. the roller coaster and the ticket office have different keys. In the day pass, it's shifted by one. In the roller coaster. It is shifted by two. Uh, so, the Caesar cipher, right? Exactly, yes. Okay. So uh, those of you that successfully cracked this simple cipher did the equivalent of the very famous Kerberosting attack. In the Kerberosting attack, someone gets uh, an attacker, gets a service ticket, the equivalent of a write ticket to a certain service, takes the encrypted part of that ticket and tries to crack it, tries to find the password that would match uh, the key that encrypted uh, this uh, message. And if they get that successfully, they can now take over that account, that service account. That means two things. They can authenticate as that account and access other services with the privileges that that account has and more interestingly, they can either modify an existing service ticket or even forge a new service ticket from scratch and then impersonate whoever they want. It could be a privileged user uh, with more rights that could grant them admin access to a certain service um, or um, another user that has some access whatsoever if they don't have access. Uh, they can do very interesting things there. They can change the validity on the tickets, make it valid for the next 20 years instead of expiring in the next 10 hours. Uh, so it's it's quite an interesting attack, Kerberos. So, uh, so Elad, and most of the time, would you say that a lot of these attacks focus on getting a ride ticket rather than a day pass? Or which yeah, is... Yeah, so realistically, uh, the day pass is the equivalent of the TGT. The TGT is encrypted in Kerberos with the KRB TGT password. That password is automatically generated by Active Directory. It has, if I remember correctly, 120 or 130 characters. Realistically, no one is going to crack that password by just you know, trying to run a password attack against a TGT. However, uh, with the right tickets or the service tickets in, in, in the AD world, uh, you very often see normal user accounts that IT admins configure to be used as service accounts by just putting a service principal name on them. And those accounts have passwords that mere mortals uh, picked. So they tend to be weaker and uh, very often they can feasibly be cracked. In fact, Kerberosting is the most common attack leading uh, to higher privileges. Mm. Um, so as I just mentioned, if you can crack the, the key for a right ticket or a service ticket, you can forge silver tickets and service tickets and, and in person to whoever you want to that service. If somehow you got the KRB TGT password or the ticket office's password, you can forge TGTs or day passes. And forged TGTs are often referred to as golden tickets. That's also a very famous attack. Uh, this usually happens when someone, an attacker, has compromised uh, Active Directory already. And then they dumped uh, the bit file and extracted the keys from there or through another attack, like for example, the DCC attack, uh, DC sync attack, which allows them to pull specific credentials of certain uh, accounts from the directory, and we'll see a demo of that uh, later on. 
So, so, if, so yeah. uh, I'm sorry, Elad, mm -hmm. I was just thinking about what you said. So if you crack, so a, a silver ticket allows you to compromise a particular service account or, and service, and if that service account has rights, it allows you to do other unpleasant things. If you have a golden ticket, you've compromised the account that signs all of the, the TGTs, right? So you could basically, you can forge practically anything, right? Is that a... Yeah, then the entire, at that point, the entire forest is yours, not just the domain, the entire forest is yours. Right, okay. Yeah. So let's talk about some mitigations for these attacks before we uh, move on to unconstrained delegation. So for Kerber hosting, as I mentioned, the success of this attack depends on having a crackable password. Uh, passwords picked by mere mortals tend to be more crackable. Uh, there is a built-in feature in AD to solve that problem. It's called group managed service accounts. These accounts uh, have randomly generated passwords generated by AD, and these passwords are rotated automatically every 30 days. So you don't have to worry about it. If for whatever reason you can't use uh, group managed service accounts and you have to, uh, let's say it's meant for some legacy application, and you have to use a normal user account uh, with an SPN. What you can do is set a very strong password that no one would uh, physically, feasibly crack and rotate it regularly. Um, what is a strong enough password? I would say go for over 30 characters uh, randomly generated. At this point, it will take a long time to crack. And if you rotate it regularly, uh, you will probably change the password before anyone even get a, gets a chance to uh, to crack it. So, so uh, Elad, that's a great top time to bring up the, I, the, the general topic of rotating passwords, because there's been, I won't say there's been controversy about it, but there's been updated guidance. NIST and Microsoft are saying, um, you know, you you shouldn't, uh, there's no benefit. There's actually a, a detriment to rotating passwords now, and I think their guidance is it's different between users and and service accounts, and certainly group managed service accounts. Can you talk about can you talk about that? What's you know why one and not yeah. the other? Or? So th there are different use cases or so abuse cases, and uh, with a normal user account. How are you going to crack that password? Typically, you would uh, perform a password spraying attack or a brute force attack against some portal, against some service, service or server. Uh, but with Kerberos, you know, strictly with service accounts, everyone in your domain can obtain a service ticket that has some cryptographic material that they can take offline and start cracking at a much higher speed. Uh, so given enough time, they will probably be successful. Uh, and if you cha change the password in a higher, at a higher frequency than they would uh, on average require to crack the password, you're always defeating them. You're always ahead. Uh, so that's the rationale here. This is why you need to change these, these passwords regularly. They're very exposed. Everyone can take some material and crack them offline. So you need to get ahead of the attackers. So, so a couple of interesting things that come out of that. Number one is, is setting a strong, unlike a your typical user account that would put like winter 2022 for a password or something like that. For these accounts, you would want to use some kind of a password generator to really create a highly entropic password that is, you know, is going to be hard to crack, not just, you know, something that a dictionary or a password spray attack could do. Uh, so, and the other aspect of this, um, I think, um, around um, passwords and password settings, could you step through from an attacker's viewpoint what a curb roasting attack would look like? I mean, how, let's say they're on the network and they're rubbing their hands and they're saying, okay, I'm going to see what's available that I can curb roast. What, what would they do? So, first, they will run an LDAP query to find all the accounts that are considered normal user accounts, not computer accounts, managed user accounts, just normal user accounts that uh, whose 
a service principal name's attribute is not empty. Mm. That means that you can actually get a service ticket uh, encrypted with the password of that account. Um, and once they have this list, it depends on the, ma the maturity of the attacker. Some attackers will actually try to figure out if I cracked this account, would it actually grant me access to anything interesting? That is would it help me well? achieve my objective. Is it worthwhile? Right. So that's the more mature attackers. Mm -hmm. The less mature attackers will just get tickets to all the accounts that meet the criteria and try their luck see if anything cracks. And that will actually, I'll, I'll skip the, 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 the AES recommendation and circle back to it and start talking about Honeypots first because that bring, it, it, it's related. That's a great um, opportunity for Honeypots because if you know that uh, attackers would definitely look at Kerberostable accounts and uh, if uh, the account seems attractive, maybe it's a member of a privileged group, they are certainly going to try to crack that. You can create such an account um, that's not actually used for anything with a very strong password that's, that no attacker is going to uh, crack and just monitor for any service ticket requests to that account specifically. Normally, no one would ever do that, only someone with malicious intent. So that will be give you a very high fidelity, very reliable indication that you have some malicious activity on in, inside your network. And so, so I highly recommend implementing something like that. It's relatively easy and costs nothing. So, so this would be this would be a, an account that really does have some kind of limited administrative rights, but you've put a password that you know is not not going to be cracked. So it's a legit administrative account, and it may ha say something something underscore admin to make it attractive. Yeah, make it a member of the domain admins group. As long as the password is strong enough, no one is going to crack it. And now we'll circle back to the to Windows Server 2019. If you upgrade your domain controllers to Windows Server 2019, and they will always make sure that the that all the service tickets. Uh, issued to users uh, use the highest encryption level available. Um, attackers would typically try to downgrade the, the cipher used to RC4 because it's cryptographically easier to calculate and they can chew through a lot more passwords per second when they try to crack that. Uh, but if uh, they cannot do that because it's Windows Server 2019 and they get AS, they can still try to crack it but uh, they will only cover a fraction of uh, the key space that they would be able to otherwise with RC4. So uh, it's uh, very, very highly recommended to upgrade to set Windows Server 2019, not only for that reason, also because 2016 is already end of life, so it's time to move on. As for golden tickets, uh, those forged uh, day passes, the solution here is to regularly rotate the password for the KRB TGT account. Uh, the best practice says that you should do that every six months or so. And if you have been breached, you should do it twice immediately. I say that in practice, if you do that once a week, every weekend, you will have no disruptions because uh, the domain controllers uh, always keep two and uh, the last two keys for uh, the Kerby TGT account so that if you change it, they can process the old TGTs issued with the previous key and also the, the one issued with the current key. And uh, Kerberos tickets by default can be used for up to 10 hours and be renewed for up to seven days. So if you do it every seven days, you will never be in a situation that someone has uh, a TGT that the domain controller doesn't know how to uh, decrypt and, uh, and process. Um, so, so uh, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, I, I was, this is a fascinating aspect to it is you can rotate it, you can rotate, you can rotate it f fairly regularly, but this is obviously a super, super critical account that you don't want to screw up. <laughs> yeah. 
but uh, as long as all the domain control is replicated successfully, uh, when you change the password, Active Directory is going to pick an adequate and long password for you and propagate it, and you don't have to wor worry about password complexity or anything like that. Everything will be taken care of. Uh, obviously, you need to be careful. You need to make sure that you have rollback procedures and uh, everything should be coordinated uh, just in case. But in practice, uh, you shouldn't have too many issues. The worst case scenario, well, the worst case scenario, everything, everything is broken. But uh, the more reasonable worst case scenario is uh, that uh, you have to reboot some servers because uh, they need to get uh, new TGTs and uh, they, for some reason, are not doing it independently without uh, getting a little nudge from a reboot. Right. And so it's worth pointing out in here that our colleague, uh, George Almeida de Pinto has written a very uh, thorough script uh, on how to safely change curb TGT passwords. And uh, I'm, I'm going to work on posting that here in the session uh, and before we're done today. So, oops. Cool. So let's move on to talk about Kerberos delegation. Let's return to our story before you get too bored with uh, the technical details. So. Remember Bill, Bill is a very successful uh, entrepreneur and he, he has a business, a, a, go, a good sense for uh, business opportunities. He figured out that uh, he should open some restaurant and some bar in, uh, in the amusement park. So we opened Luna Bistro and Luna Bar. And if a visitor wants to eat or drink, just like any other ride, first they go to the ticket office. So let's see how that goes. Alice wants to have lunch, so she goes to the ticket office, presents her day pass, the ticket office decrypts and validates the day pass, then copies all information from the day pass to a new uh, lunch ticket for Alice, and, the, and then it's encrypted with a new key that only uh, the ticket office and the bistro, no, the, the employees at the bistro know. And those of you who are quick can see that the shift this time is three. Uh, one, two, and now we're at three. So now it's lunchtime. Alice goes to the bistro and she wants to order a burger and a beer. But we have a problem. The burger is served at the bistro and the beer is served at the bar. So today we will talk about the naive solution to that problem, which is unconstrained delegation. There are also other flavors of delegation, terrible delegation, constrained delegation, resource-based constrained delegation. Today we will discuss the legacy unconstrained delegation option. So what does Alice do in this case? She goes to the bistro and she presents her lunch ticket to the waitress. And she also hands over her day pass to the waitress. The waitress decrypts the, beast, the, the, the lunch ticket and validates it so it's not expired. Alice is a member of the lunch group so she can get a burger. So far, so good. Now the waitress can go to the Ticket office on behalf of Alice, present Alice's day pass, the ticket office decrypts and validates it, and then uh, copies all information from Alice's day pass to a new ride ticket. And uh, this time it's a ride ticket to for Alice to the bar. This ticket is of course, of course encrypted with a new key that only the ticket office and the barman know. This time the shift is four. We're very uh, sophisticated here. Now the waitress can go to the bar, present Alice's bar ticket to the barman. The barman decrypts and validates the ticket. It's not expired. Alice is old enough to drink, and she's a member of the happy hour group. So the barman serves the waitress a beer for Alice. Alice gets a burger and a beer, and everyone is happy. And of course, we have to go through such a diagram again. This mechanism exists in Active Directory as well, in Kerberos. Uh, so let's see how it goes. We have uh, two services here. Uh, a front-end service, service A, could be a web server, for example, and service B, which is a back-end service, let's say a database or some back-end APIs. And we have a user that wants to authenticate to service A, and service A needs to impersonate that user to service B. So first, the user needs to obtain a TGT, just like 
and normal Kerberos authentication. You'll, and then the user needs to obtain a service ticket to service A. You'll note here that service A is configured with an attribute called trusted forward delegation. And that's an indication that service A is uh, configured for unconstrained delegation, that users are allowed to hand over their uh, PGTs to that service. So when the domain controller, domain, domain controller issues a service ticket for the user to service A, it is marked as okay as delegate. It tells the user that it's okay. If you want to send your uh, TGT to service A, you can do so. So when the user authenticates to service A, it sends two tickets to service A, the service ticket and the TGT. Now service A can take the user's TGT, present it to the domain controller and request a service ticket for that user to service B, then present that ticket to service B and impersonate the user. So as I mentioned, there's an attribute called trusted for delegation. Uh, it's actually a flag, a, a user account control attribute. Um, and it indicates that this account is uh, configured for unconstrained delegation. Now, not every user uh, can set this flag. Even if you have an admin user that can change everything in a certain computer account or service account, you will not be able to uh, set this flag unless you also have the SE enable delegation privilege, which by default only domain admins have. Now, unconstrained delegation is very dangerous. And the reason is that when the waitress goes to the ticket office on behalf of Alice and she presents Alice's day pass and the ticket office validates it. After that, the waitress technically can ask uh, for a service ticket or a ride ticket on behalf of Alice to anything, not just the bar. The waitress can ask for a ticket to the roller coaster. The ticket office will just copy the information from the day pass to the new roller coaster ticket as it is, encrypt it with the roller coaster key. And now the waitress can go to the roller coaster pretend that she's Alice and get on the ride. And maybe she's not allowed on the ride. Maybe she's not tall enough. Maybe she's not old enough. Maybe she's just not a member of the roller coaster group. So unconstrained delegation is dangerous. And of course, the same risk exists in Active Directory. As an attacker, if I compromise a service account or a host that is configured for unconstrained delegation, meaning it has the trusted for delegation flag set, I can take over any victim, any user or computer that authenticates to that host that I compromised. And then the question is, where do victims come from? So there are three options. First is sort of a watering hole attack. You sort of sit and wait. And maybe you wait for users to authenticate to that server that you compromised. And when they happen to do so, maybe you put in some file share a link uh, to, a, to a resource on that um, host. For example, an, a link with an icon that would be loaded from a share on that host that you compromised and uh, is configured for unconstrained delegation. So, so, of, Eli, yeah. so, so for an example, not to interrupt, but I'm, I guess I'm interrupting, is is to think about in in this unconstrained delegation. So this is, so unconstrained delegation is something that uh, typically an administrator might have done. Um, I heard a great quote that says, you know, Active Directory has been around for 20 plus years and it's the host of, it's, it's, the, it's the compiled host of sins over 20 years. So maybe 15 years ago, somebody that had to do something in a hurry set up unconstrained delegation uh, to a web server. So is this so? Any, so for example, this could be an attacker having gotten their hands on a web server and compromised the web server. Absolutely, that's that's a great example. Um, it's very often seen either with some legacy S servers systems uh, that uh, required that many years ago, or uh, when they make a mistake. I've seen an organization once that. Um, as, as their uh, provisioning procedure 
the for SQL servers, they always set them with unconstrained delegation, always. So all the SQL servers in the, in the organization had unconstrained delegation. Uh, it happens. Unfortunately, it happens. And Wasn't in a moment, that the same see, Yeah. Sorry? Wasn't that the same organization that also set all the service accounts for the SQL servers to be administered to be domain admins? Uh, yep, <laughs> that's one of those. Um, yeah, and, and I'll, we'll show you a quick demo in a minute. In a minute, I will show you the risk, uh, demonstrate the risk, uh, and how it can lead to compromising the entire domain. Uh, another place, uh, another source for victims is social engineering. Uh, you can send an email to someone with an embedded resource that would be loaded from this unconcerned delegation server. You can also just pick up the phone and call the help desk and say, hey, there's something wrong with this server. And then when they log in, probably with their privileged account to troubleshoot, you will capture their PGP and be able to use it to access other mm. servers. Mm. And the best source of victims is bring your own victim. Uh, or in other words, authentication coercion. There are several techniques that coerce a remote computer to connect to a path of your choosing. Those uh, techniques would target attacks that run a system or a network service or a virtual account, which means that when these services try to access network resources, they will authenticate using the computer account. There are three great examples of that. Uh, the printer bug, that's the older one, uh, disclosed in 2018. Uh, it abuses the print spooler and gets it to authenticate uh, to whatever path you choose, uh, which has never been patched. And uh, the print spooler is on by default, even on domain controllers, and it's running the system. It's a, a great source of joy for attackers. <laughs> Uh, Petit Potam is a famous one, uh, it was disclosed uh, last year, uh, around July, I think. Uh, it abuses the encrypted file system uh, remote protocol. Uh, it was patched by Microsoft. Um, and there's another one that was uh, disclosed very recently. It's called Shadow Coerce, and uh, that abuses the file server remote VSS protocol. And I'll tell you a secret, these are the ones that are public publicly disclosed. There are many more that attackers and uh, red teams know about and they do not disclose because why burn a uh, perfectly good tradecraft? So there are lots of them. So, so let's look at an attack chain that abuses that. In this example, we will look at the printer bug. So let's say an attacker compromised service A. Service A is trusted for delegation, meaning that it is set with unconstrained delegation. But what the attacker really wants to target is service B. So what would the attacker do? It would, the attacker would uh, uh, take advantage of one of those authentication coercion techniques, in this case, the printer bug, to uh, connect to the print spooler on service B and tell it to connect back to the print spooler on service A. And when service B authenticates to connect to service A, service A will say, hey, you need to authenticate first. And then service B will authenticate using uh, Kerberos authentication and delegate to service A its PGT. Now, the question is, let's say I got PGT of service B. How can I abuse that to actually gain uh, access to service B? So there are two different cases here. One case is that service B is a domain controller. That makes things easier because what do, what do domain controllers do? They replicate. So you can take this ticket and connect to a domain controller, tell the domain controller, hey, I'm a domain controller. Can you please tell me everything you know about uh, this Kerberos TGT account of yours, including the password? And it will. And we will see a demo of that in a second. If it's not a domain controller, uh, the attack chain is more elaborate. We won't uh, get into uh, the details of that in this session here. Uh, but I'll tell you that there are two different techniques uh, that uh, would allow an attacker to compromise any member server uh, if they get if they can put their hands on that uh, computer's uh, PGT. 
So now it's demo time. Before this, we start the demo, I'll just um, uh, give you uh, a quick uh, background so that you, so it's easier to follow. What we're going to see there is actually exactly this diagram here. We're going to be on a server. In the lab, it's going to be called server one, and we're going to target a DC. That the name of that host would be DC. Easy to follow. Uh, service, service one will be trusted for delegation. We're going to use a, a tool called print spooler to abuse the printer bug and tell the DC to connect to service one, capture the TDT, and then use the DC sync technique to get the Kerby TGT uh, password uh, for that domain. So let's see. All right, so we're on uh, a host. We can see here that this host is server one. We can use the Active Directory module, PowerShell module, to look at the properties of server one. And it will show us that server one is indeed configured for uh, unconstrained delegation. The trusted, to, trusted for delegation flag is set to true. In, in another window, we will run a tool called Rubius to monitor every five seconds for a logon event from the DC. When that happens, Rubius will uh, show us on the screen the TGT that came through. Now we're using a spool sample to tell the DC to connect to a server one. And within a few seconds, we can see on the screen here this base64 encoded blob that uh, represents the TGT of the DC. Now that we have this TGT, we can use it. First, we will start a new session here, a new logon session in a new console that doesn't have any valid credentials. This new uh, black console does not have any valid credentials. It cannot access any network resources at all. If we run the KList command, we can see that there are no cached Kerberos tickets. And if we use the tool Mimikatz to perform the DC sync attack, uh, it should fail. Uh, we'll give it a second and we'll see error code five. Error code five represents access is denied. Now we can load the ticket into this session. We'll run KList again and see that it is indeed there and run the DC sync attack again. This time it should work because it has a TGT that has access to it. And indeed, we can see here on the screen the NTLM hash of the Kerby TGT account, which is also the RC4 encryption key, and the AES encryption keys for the Kerby TGT account. Now, with these keys, we can forge uh, golden tickets for uh, any user we like. And that took, what, 15 seconds? <laughs> 30 seconds? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, this is the reason unconstrained delegation is so awful because these co authentication coercion uh, techniques are all over the place. Um, so if you can avoid unconstrained delegation, do that. So mitigations, of course, do not use unconstrained delegation. It's one of the uh, most dangerous configurations in Active Directory. Uh, constrained delegation is a more secure alternative, but constrained delegation has some security issues as well. So do that carefully. So, so, uh, yes. so this is, I think of the, uh, I think of the doctor's answer here, you know, which is, uh, <clears throat> doctor, it hurts when I do this. And then the doctor says, then don't do this. It'll be $50. Right. So, um, <laughs> uh, so this is an, I'm sure a question on everyone's mind is, okay, how do I even know if I have unconstrained delegation in my environment? So a simple LDAP query uh, can show that to you, uh, but it's uh, actually it's not a simple LDAP query because you're searching for a certain flag in a complex attribute. Uh, but if you Google that, you can find that uh, that query. Or if you want an easier way uh, to perform this scan, you can uh, run a tool called Purple Knight, which we will uh, uh, give you uh, provide a link to download that. Uh, that uh, can run sort of an audit against your AD and find all those accounts that have unconstrained delegation and shouldn't, uh, and many other misconfigurations uh, that you probably have. 
Uh, I think we'll talk about that tool a bit more in depth in the next slide. Um, another thing that you should do is add all privileged accounts to the protected users group. When a user is added to the protected users group, it is not permitted to be delegated, not through unconstrained delegation and not through constrained delegation. And there are many other uh, protections that these accounts get. The validity of their TGTs is for only four hours. They're not permitted to perform NTLM authentication, which is another evil thing that is never going away. Uh, you get a lot of benefits by adding your protected users, by adding your privileged accounts to the protected users group. You can only do that to user accounts, though. You cannot add service accounts to the protected users group because it will break things. And Purple Knight. So as I mentioned, we have a, a free tool called Purple Knight. And uh, you can download it from a link provided in the, um, with the resources for this uh, uh, session. Uh, it's a great tool to assess your AD uh, and identify uh, common misconfigurations uh, that you should be uh, you should address uh, both uh, before an attack to mitigate um, exposures that could allow attackers to escalate the privileges, and after an attack uh, to maybe identify paths that would allow the attackers to regain control if you try to remove them, or maybe some ch changes that the attackers introduced as domain persistence to allow them to maintain their access to the environment, even if you try to, um, to uh, remove them. You will get scores for different categories of configurations. And if you track that, you can see how, we, how you improve over time, hopefully. Uh, I highly recommend using this free tool as a first step to see uh, how bad things are in your environment. And now it's question time. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about this topic, we're happy to uh, discuss them. What a great presentation, both of We really appreciate it. And um, we do have a couple questions. So let's jump right into them. The first one we have for you both are, what are the risks to leaving NPLM open on a Kerberos environment? OK, so there are two risks related to NTLM. First of all, if an attacker manages to intercept an NTLM exchange, a child response exchange, they can potentially crack that exchange to get the password of the client to try to authenticate. Uh, the NTLM response is, is encrypted or hashed using uh, the NTLM hash of that account. If the password is not strong enough, uh, the attacker will be able to crack it. If you have NTLM v1 enabled, which is not a default, it's even worse. You, the attacker is guaranteed to be able to crack that hash within 24 hours. So wow. uh, that's really bad. Another thing, which is even worse, is uh, the NTLM relay attack. And uh, it's a middle middle attack. The attacker is between the client and the server, and the attacker can tell uh, basically relay the message between the client and the server until a session is established and then impersonate the client to the server. Uh, two very bad examples is a certificate enrollment service. That was uh, uh, a huge thing when, when Petit Potam was released uh, earlier this year, published early, earlier this year. It uh, could allow the attacker to obtain a certificate for any host in the environment and then compromise that host. It's pretty bad. It's a, po a point and shoot attack. Another thing is LDAP. If uh, the attacker can perform an NTLM relay attack to LDAP as a computer, again, they can change certain configurations on the computer account that would allow the attacker to compromise the corresponding host. Uh, so what's the mitigation for that? LDAP signing, sorry. Signing and channel binding, it doesn't have to be LDAP. So whatever service it is, sign and channel bind. Uh, that will ensure uh, that uh, NTLM relay attacks are mitigated. And also um, 
micro segmentation. Lock down hosts as much as you can at the network level uh, to make sure that no connections, inbound or outbound connections that should not happen, go through. Wow, thank you. That was, that was wonderful. Okay, let's hop over to the next question. So would encrypting LDAP on port 636 prevent that LDAP listing? Uh, no. So, if it's uh, over, if, if, if it's LDAPS, if LDAP is encrypted, it basically means that the client needs to uh, perform the SSL TLS handshake before connecting to the service. Uh, it will not, if, if the client has uh, a valid account that would allow the client to authenticate after establishing the secure, the, the secure channel, uh, it wouldn't prevent any listing, but it, it, it is definitely a first step in preventing uh, NTLM relay attacks to LDAP. Uh, first, you need the encryption, L LDAP-S, um, and second, you also need channel binding, LDAP channel binding. Uh, together, they will stop the, the, the NTLM attacks. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And it looks like we have time for one last question. Excuse me. Um, before we head out here, is Purple Knight a standalone tool, and is the report received shared? Okay, so Purple Knight is a standalone tool. Uh, once you download it, you can uh, run it locally uh, in your environment. Even if your environment is air gapped, not going to be a problem. It will run. Um, uh, you just need to run it as a domain user. You don't need high privileges, just any domain user will do. And the report is not shared with us, it's not uploaded to the cloud, it's all local. So you, should, you don't need to worry about the privacy or leaking any sensitive information outside of your organization. The only recommendation I would make is that uh, if you're in a uh, well-monitored environment, make sure your SOC knows that you're going to run it because they'll start to see unusual uh, behavior from the one client, which may trigger some alerts. Yeah, very good point. Oh, that's a great tip. Perfect. Well, thank you both. We are out of time for questions today, but if Folks, if you didn't get your question asked, please go ahead and pop those into the, the Q&A box, and we will share them with this in Paris team today um, so we can get those addressed at a later time. But Elad, Sean, fantastic presentation. Thank you both so much for your time today and sharing your insight. It was really, really helpful. Thank you, everyone, who was able to join today. And, of course, big thanks to in Paris for, for sponsoring today's event and making it happen so we could have this great content. So thank you all, and, and we'll have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.